Hello. Thank you for joining us for today's book forum. Our hashtag is Cato Events for those of you joining via social media. My name is Chelsea Follett. I am a policy analyst in Cato's Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, as well as managing editor of humanprogress.org, a website that chronicles with data the tremendous progress that humanity has made, a mission shared by the book that we will be discussing today. Even in the middle of a pandemic, when it's easy to feel like things are only getting worse, this book reminds us to take a step back and take a broader historical view of where we are today and where we go from here. Fewer, richer, greener. Prospects for Humanity in an Age of Abundance meticulously documents the advances that mankind has made in many areas. This book shows how our species has in many ways become greener, such as through greater energy efficiency, and provides reasons for environmental optimism. It shows how phenomenally wealthy humanity is now compared to the past, and how much more widespread access to education and medicine has become. Uh, how open more and more societies are today compared to the past, and how much we take for granted. And this book shows how around the world birth rates are falling and the total population will soon decrease, rendering widely held fears about overpopulation irrelevant. Now, some, myself included, would argue that even if the population were to grow, that such a trend could still go hand in hand with growing abundance. But in any case, all estimates suggest that the population is set to decrease and that overpopulation is thus a concern that is just not backed by data. The overall message of this book, a message of rational optimism, is one that is greatly needed perhaps now more than ever. I am pleased to introduce the author, Lawrence B. Siegel. He is the Gary P. Brinson Director of Research at the CFA Institute Research Foundation, Senior Advisor to OCP Capital LLC, and an independent consultant, writer, and speaker specializing in investment management. He holds a BA and an MBA in finance from the University of Chicago. You can follow him on Twitter at Lawrence B. Siegel, and he's having some technical difficulties with his camera right now, so we're going to be starting out with audio only from him. Providing constructive and critical comments on this book, we are delighted to also have Brian Kaplan join us. He is a professor of economics at George Mason University and a New York Times best-selling author. He is also a research fellow at the Mercatus Center and an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. His books include The Myth of the Rational Voter, The Case Against Education, a graphic novel titled Open Borders, and perhaps most relevant to our discussion today, the book Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids. You can follow him on Twitter at Brian underscore Kaplan. After their presentation, our speakers will be taking questions from you, the audience. Uh, please submit your questions via our event webpage or through Facebook or through Twitter or YouTube. Please use our event hashtag Cato events uh, when submitting your questions to make sure that we see them. And feel free to start posting your questions before the Q&A begins. We'll get to as many of those as we can. So without further ado, uh, Larry will now begin his presentation to be followed by Brian's and then each will have a chance to respond to the other before we open things up to questions. Uh, Larry, please begin. Thank you, Chelsea. Since you gave my speech, I don't have to. And uh, thank you for summarizing my book so beautifully. What I really uh, meant to do in, in the book was to express my view that the world is not coming to an end. Yes, we are all going to die, but we're not all going to die at the same time. And the amount of progress that's been made by the human race in the last 250 years is, is just unbelievable, considering the uh, millennia before that, when, when progress was slow and quite discontinuous. 
some people say it's 30 to 1 gain in individual welfare uh, since the Industrial Revolution began in the late 1700s. Some people say it's 100 to 1, but we don't know how to measure the difference between a, a jet airplane flight and a ride on a horse. What we do know how to do is calculate the growth of the economy in the short run, and if you chain together enough short runs, you get a long run, and it's been about 1.8% a year for the global economy since the uh, beginning of the 19th century, which means that at the beginning of that period, about 97 or 98% of the people in the world lived in what we would now call extreme poverty, and now it's 9%. The remarkable fact is that it was 40% only 40 years ago. So about half of this progress is in the last 40 years and is outside the United States, outside of Europe, outside of Japan. It's in what we call the developing world, China, India, and Africa, and so forth. So what happened at the beginning of the period was that the what we now call first world countries, the developed countries, raced ahead. It was it was really uh, an increase in inequality uh, because all of a sudden it, it was possible to not be poor in a handful of countries in Northwestern Europe and then the United States and later, later Japan and a few other places. But then around 1945 to 1950, uh, the pendulum shifted and we started growing more slowly. The rest of the world started growing more quickly and instead of the great divergence, we experience a, gr a great convergence where other people uh, who have been less fortunate until now are playing catch up and are catching up with us very quickly. The issues of population and the environment were also mentioned by, by Chelsea in her introduction. And I, I, I just want to bring up why I'm talking about them. The first reason is that the population explosion has been drummed into our heads as an existential risk from the moment we enter grade school. And, and there's been very little pushback about saying, well, first of all, maybe it's not all bad that the population is growing. I think that's a point Brian Kaplan is going to make. But at some point, the population has to stop growing. Everyone's familiar with the thought that anything that cannot continue forever will stop. And if the population could conceivably grow to 15 billion or 100 billion or a trillion, it's still going to stop at some point uh, because uh, the, 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 the biomass of all the people on the earth can't be larger than the earth. It, it's not very easy for us to populate other planets or, or travel to other solar systems. So this planet is the one we've got. And I, I think that uh, if this population explosion is going to stop at some point, uh, how about as soon as possible? It seems to me that the 9 to 11 billion people that we expect will be the peak population later in this century is really quite enough. And will not stress the environment uh, and will not stress individual people the way that it would if we went to a much higher number, which was originally uh, what the uh, demographers were afraid of. And uh, so we've gotten a burden, a burden taken off of our shoulders, which is how to feed, clothe, and house uh, an another massive number of people in the first world the population explosion really is over. The, the numbers are still growing because there are a lot of young people still having babies at the, but at a very slow rate. And I, I don't know, uh, are, are you able to put up uh, my slide called the population explosion? Or if I share the screen, can you, uh, uh, what, will the audience be able to see it? with your presentation now and we'll try to bring up that slide uh, if we're able to later. Okay. I 
have a map of the world in the slide that we may or may not be showing. And basically the whole world is one shade or another of green or blue, except for Sub-Saharan Africa and a couple of little spots in the Middle East. The blue is declining populations. And right now it's Japan, Spain, Italy, uh, the uh, little country in the, uh, yeah, that, that's either Serbia or Croatia, Ukraine, um, and Poland have declining populations already. The dark green are countries which have a replacement rate below two, and doesn't quite replace itself. And the population will eventually decline if those low fertility rates continue, but it hasn't started to decline yet. And that those are the big population centers of the world, China, the United States, Russia, Brazil, and there are some others that are surprising. For example, Iran is, is in that group. Then the lighter green, the replacement rate is a little above two, but it, it's so little above two that it, it, the population will stabilize in, in the next generation or so, and that includes India. So we really covered the whole world except for Sub-Saharan Africa, where fertility is also declining, but not at a rate that will stabilize the population soon. So the African population is going to grow pretty fast for most of the rest of the century. Interestingly, uh, Deidre McCloskey, a professor and uh, economist, philosopher, kind of a, a jack of all trades, pointed out that with an Africa of three or four billion people, I don't think it'll be four billion, but some people say it will, and with the tremendous genetic and population diversity that exists in, in Africa more than in any other place in the world, it's the top end that, that counts for, for culture and, and progress. By 2100, a large proportion of the artists, scientists, philosophers, technologists, and so forth and in the world will be black. Some other place. So that, that's a big change and, and one I actually look forward to. Also, the, a, a big and relatively rich Africa in 2100 will it'll still be the poorest continent in the world, but it will be Thailand poor, not Zambia poor. And th that's another tremendously welcome change, that Africa is beginning to get the growth rates that Asia had in the last generation. I just hope that those are sustained for a long time. So the population explosion is all but over. It's not over, but it is certainly uh, a, a welcome change from the, the tune that we heard in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which is that we are all going to be standing shoulder to shoulder uh, with nothing to eat. Now, the, the, the biggest health problem in the world related to food is not starvation, but obesity. And let me move on briefly to the environment, and then I'll come back to the main theme of my talk, which is environmental, uh, I'm sorry, economic history, and what that economic history tells us about our future. The environment is a concern for a lot of people, including me. I, I don't really want it to get any hotter than it is right now. It's about 100 degrees in, in the room where I'm broadcasting. But there's a cycle called the Kuznets curve, which is, oh, sorry, I'm going to turn that off. A primitive society looks very environmentally beautiful and clean. It isn't because people are despoiling the resources right around them at a very high rate. They have a high discount rate for comparing so what, what you get in the present uh, to what you save for the future. And, and the reason is you, you have to eat. So you'll sacrifice some, some future benefit to make sure that you get what you need today. 
however, as you begin to industrialize, the, this pristine, primitive world gets very dirty very quickly. And we saw that in the United States probably by 18... 70 to 1890, air and water pollution have become a serious problem. Uh, we know about the London smogs of the past that have killed thousands of people uh, as recently as the 1950s. And that's because of, of heavy industry. It, it pollutes. Uh, there's no incentive not to pollute. And then gradually the tide turns and the environment becomes cleaner. It doesn't become cleaner all by itself. First of all, you need to have environmental regulations or pricing of environmental assets and liabilities. The, the past... Well, our, it's worked. Our air and water in the United States here are very clean. In Europe, it's similar, and in many other countries. It's similar. China is beginning on that path now. India is a little farther behind. But also, as we transition from most of the productivity of the world being heavy industry to services and things like technology, which are have more of an environmental footprint like light industry, uh, the environment will get cleaner that way. If you look at the very richest countries in the world, Switzerland, Norway, there, there are some others, the whole country kind of looks like a national park. And the United States, of course, invented the idea of national parks in the 1870s when President Grant turned Yellowstone into a preserve that was intended to be left alone forever. That this trend has spread to most countries which now have national parks. They also, most countries now have environmental regulations. But more importantly, uh, people simply want a clean environment for themselves and for people around them. So they're willing to pay taxes uh, that, that help with that. They're willing to pay higher prices and have the money to pay higher prices for environmentally sound industrial practices and, and transportation practices. And so instead of an environmental catastrophe, I'm protecting something of an environmental success. It's not perfect brain could not not that uh, thank you many years ago and just yeah, so Chelsea, you know I, um on time you uh you're getting a little close to time if you want to start wrapping up yeah i'm going to start wrapping up right now uh the environment, the, in the British Museum, there's an exhibit of uh, artifacts from Doggerland, which is a country that you probably haven't heard of because it's between English and uh, coastline and Germany in the middle of the North Sea. And right now it's at the bottom of the ocean, but it was heavily populated and the artifacts from Doggerland are on display for everyone to see. So the sea level has been rising for a long time. It used to be possible to walk from England to Germany and you have to take a plane. So I don't think that climate change is anything new, but we are going to have to adapt to it. And having 1.8% economic growth for the rest of the century, if we can somehow manage that, and I think we will, will produce enough wealth that it will make that transition much safer and much easier than walking from Doggerland to either England or Germany, where you could find higher ground in the 7th millennium BC. So uh, just to uh, conclude, I, I'm not going to have time to, nor do I have the inclination to describe why or how economies grow consistently for very long periods of time. And it's a tough sell right now because things are temporarily getting worse for a lot of people, but they will get better. This isn't forever. We've been through other pandemics that were worse, and we've been through other pandemics that weren't as bad, as well as wars, depressions, and so forth. But uh, this uh, slow, steady progress seems to be an inherent uh, part of human nature, 
if we have good government and if we have freedom to pursue our own interests and the interests of people we care about, such as our children, without interference. And with the, on that, I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to go on so long without interruption. It's uh, time to have an open discussion. Thank you so much, Larry. We'll now go to Brian's presentation. All right, uh, thank you very much, Chelsea. Uh, so to start, uh, Larry and I have vast areas of agreement. Uh, first of all, until March, the world was getting better at a, uh, getting richer at a marvelous pace. Absolute poverty has been disappearing before our eyes, even after 10,000 years of apparent permanence. Then, uh, we also agree that conventional measures sharply understate this glorious reality, uh, because first of all, the environment keeps getting cleaner, and second of all, the quality of goods keeps getting higher. Larry didn't have the time to talk about it, but this is called CPI bias. It's a very big deal, and it does mean that standard measures really don't show us how great things have gotten or had until March. Uh, and then third point where I agree with Larry is that, like it or not, global population is leveling off. All right, now, my overarching complaint about Larry's book is this. Larry is so excited to share his conclusions that he rushes through the arguments in their favor. When the arguments are strong, the rushing doesn't do much harm. But when the arguments are weak, the rushing leads Siegel to embrace some serious errors. And I'm going to talk about three errors that I see uh, leading in this book. All right, so the first error. The leveling off of population now is a good thing. Siegel actually has no argument for this other than to say that population growth can't be a good thing forever. Right? And even in his talk, he had a line that really made my ears perk up when he said, well, since it can't go on forever, how about ending it as soon as possible? Right? This to me is just a bizarre claim. Think about it. This argument would have been just as true when global population was 8,000 people. 8 million people or 800 million people. And so if we had listened to people like Larry in these earlier times, we would still be stuck at these much lower levels of population, or at least saying this is a, would be a good thing for things to be. Now, Larry is right to say that Julian Simon did dodge this question of when rising population would finally start to be a problem. Uh, but to, Larry's, uh, to uh, you know, Simon's credit, and uh, Siegel did uh, grant this, uh, you know, so Simon did genuinely demonstrate vast, neglected upsides of population, especially this effect on innovation. Right? Almost all innovation on Earth in human history really does come and has come from the high population areas. And this can hardly be a coincidence. Places that hardly have any people hardly have any creative people. Right? And again, the key idea here is the one that comes from Thomas Jefferson, of when I light my candle, it does not turn. No, it does not make my candle go out. One candle can illuminate a thousand candles. It's the same with ideas. One idea from one person on Earth really can spread and benefit to the entire planet, which means that we can increase the welfare of the average human being by having a larger total population because there's a larger total number of inventors. All right, and furthermore, I would add that the main downsides of population, which are first of all pollution and second of all, congestion, can be easily mitigated with pollution taxes and tolls rather than by actually reducing population or keeping it down with, rather than with fewer births. Now, my key point, uh, Siegel presents no evidence in the entire book that I can find that extra population has stopped being a good thing yet. All right, so why is he so happy about falling birth rates? When I heard that line that he said that if it can't go on forever, we should stop it as soon as possible, this makes me think about being at a party. You're five minutes in, and then someone someone says, well, the party can't go on forever, so we might as well go home. No, wrong. Look, if it's still fun, if it's still working, let's let the party go on for as long as it can go. So why would you want population to stop growing when it is still beneficial? As far as we can tell, these bad effects of population overall have not kicked in. Would you really want to be in a world where there were half as many people and we had to give up half of the, of the great ideas and inventions that we've enjoyed? I, for one, would not. So uh, now you might know there's also in the book, uh, Larry says that the world seems pretty crowded. I'm just wondering what world he is in. 
And I just drove down to Florida. The United States is almost empty, right? And much of the world is almost empty. Even when you're in Europe, which is much more highly, high, uh, much more densely populated, still there are vast empty areas. So, and, and, you know, it has been pointed out, and it's true. You could fit the entire world's population into the continental U.S. at the density of Los Angeles, which is itself a low-density city. So then why not hope for a world population of 20 billion or 50 billion or 100 billion or even a trillion? Uh, you can say that's just absurd to think that the world could support a trillion people. But imagine how absurd multiplying the human population by a factor of 25 would have seemed a thousand years ago. Yet this absurdity happened and it's been awesome. All right, that's the first error. Uh, second error, uh, we, should we should just live with or even celebrate declining birth rates. Uh, now, if you do the math, and I actually did this math in an earlier piece that I wrote for Cato Unbound, uh, it turns out that large tax credits for births are actually the holy grail of tax policy. They more than pay for themselves in the long run. We can reasonably expect, according to the numbers that I crunched, that if you were to give every parent a $10,000 tax credit once for each kid that they had, this would ultimately yield about $250,000 in net present value for the treasury. $10,000 tax, uh, $10,000 off your taxes once, eventually a quarter million dollars in taxes that wind up getting paid, or actually net taxes, because we're counting the additional cost of the services, uh, which seems like a fantastic deal. Uh, another policy that would be very likely to increase birth rates would just be housing deregulation. City dwellers have very few kids because people in cities are crammed for space. But this is largely a product of zoning regulation and land use regulation, policies that have grossly inflated the price of housing, especially in the country's most desirable areas. Deregulate, make housing cheap again, and then having a large family once again seems like a good deal. All right, third error. Larry didn't talk about this at all in his talk, but it really did stand out to me as an economist. So in the talk or in the book, Larry talks about Gary Becker's Economics of the Family. And he's very eager to say that Becker's Economics of the Family readily explains declining family size. I'm not going to go into the whole story, but you can just Google Gary Becker and find out what Becker said. I love Gary Becker, but I think he was just deeply wrong on this. Here's the reality. Kids were never a good financial investment in all of human history. When both economists and anthropologists have tried to crunch the numbers, they have found that kids are not a good way for families to make money. As a business model, hiring able-bodied adult farmers makes far more sense than breeding helpless infants and waiting for 15 years. Uh, yes, uh, La uh, Larry's right. Modern economies do offer a lot of extra, extra opportunities for child-free fun, but, they also drastically reduce the pain of rearing kids. And furthermore, they offer many extra opportunities for family fun. So why rising wealth actually does cause falling birth rates is a fascinating question for social scientists that social scientists have failed to successfully answer yet. It is premature to say that we figured this all out. We haven't. It's a good, it's a, it is a great mystery. All right. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Larry, would you like to take a brief moment to uh, respond, keeping in mind that we're trying to keep as much time available for Q&A as possible? Sure. Well, first of all, these aren't errors or differences of opinion, but you knew that. Um, <laughs> yes, I rushed through. I, I only had 400 pages. I uh, wanted to say a lot of stuff. Basically, you know, I'm a modest guy, so writing about the history and future of the human race uh, seemed like a bit of a stretch for me in the first place. Uh, but I wanted to get it all in there, so I rushed through without feeling the need to address every possible critique, which you've done very, very well. Uh, in terms of population, that's really the only one I'm going to have time to address. 40% of the primary productivity of the, of the Earth in terms of the sun reaching plants and having that plant growth consumed by us as opposed to somebody else like a buffalo or 40 percent of it is already being used by human beings you can change the total amount of primary productivity by turning the whole planet into a greenhouse but you can't change it indefinitely high you can't make it, it, it we can't multiply it by 50 or 100 
uh, we might be able to multiply it by two, and we do want to have a reserve uh, for other species and just for waste and mistakes and disasters and 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 the reasons why you don't want to use 100% of the pro productivity that's available from nature. So the, the peak population isn't going to be a trillion <laughs> Uh, because you do run up against physical constraints, but it doesn't have to be 9 billion either. Uh, you've made a valid point that there are Einsteins and Beethovens and Darwins who will never be born because the population is leveling off. We're, we're just going to have to live with that. And if it had stopped in, in, in 1700, uh, we, we wouldn't have Einstein and Beethoven and Darwin the, the first time. So... There's a trade-off. Economists do evaluate trade-offs for a living between how many people we want in order to get the benefits of those people and how many people we want in order to prevent the costs, because every benefit has a cost, of, uh, of a much larger population. Because they do have to be fed and clothed and housed and educated and all kinds of other neat stuff. I'm going to uh, stop there just because it, it, I, I could rebut this all day, but never completely succeed because all the points you made are valid, and, but but can but can be responded to if I had time to study them. All right, thank you, uh, Brian. Would you like to say anything else? Sure. Q &A? I feel like it might be misunderstanding, Larry, because there's no way we could be growing 40% of maximum food right now. We don't even use 40% of the land for agriculture or anything like 40% of the potentially productive land. Never mind all of the other ways that we can go and get food production up. Just the amount of waste in food production, really, like that, that can be reduced. So I don't see, so maybe I'm just misunderstanding, Larry, but. I mean, like, you know, the idea that we couldn't grow 100 times as much food as we currently do just seems very hard to believe to me. Uh, and then on this other point of, well, like it or not, we just have to live with falling population. We don't. Like I said, there is very good evidence that if you give the uh, tax incentives to families in particular, that they will have more kids. Uh, there is a you know, broad literature on this. And the main punchline of it is that single parents don't respond much to incentives for fertility because most of the kids that they have are accidental. On the other hand, stable couples do respond quite substantially to incentives for fertility. They're already in the business of having kids, so it's not that hard to tip the, tip the scales to get them to have another one. Uh, so in that piece that I wrote for K to Unbound, I went over what I thought was the very best evidence on this, but I think it is quite solid. And again, like, my proposal is really quite simple. It just says that in any, any year in which you have a baby, then you get $10,000 off your taxes, right? And based upon the calculations of how much an additional taxes a baby will eventually pay compared to the services they will use, doing proper adjustments for the time in which these will occur, that looks like it is a fantastic deal, right? So uh, anyway, so I encourage, encourage you to take a look at that, but this is something where the math is so much in my favor that I would have to, that the numbers would have to be off by a massive factor on multiple parts in order for this not to be true, right? And then, like I said, you know, also, hou also housing deregulation. The promise of this for getting birth rates back up is very good. Uh, now, within a country, you might say, well, it's just that people live in cities are people that aren't very interested in having kids. Once people decide they want to have kids, they move out. So you can't really say the cities are causing fertility to go down. Uh, but if you think about it, there is a good way of testing this, and that is let's look at fertility in city states. So in a city state, you have a population of people that are in a city and they can't easily go anywhere else because the whole country is a city. And what you'll see is that in city states, uh, the fertility rate is extremely low. So basically um, you know, what I'm saying is if we could go and take advantage of the fact that most countries are not city states and we can go and we can then deregulate housing to get much higher production of housing, allowing cheap housing, then this would again be very likely to increase fertility. Uh, anecdotally, so I live in the suburbs in a very large house, I have four kids, and I've honestly told people, yeah, well, if I lived in an apartment, I don't think I would want four kids, right? When I was having additional kids, I said, let's go and soundproof these doors so we don't have to hear the babies crying so much. You're in an apartment, you can't do that. So just figuring out ways of getting cheap housing available 
in addition to being good in all the other ways, it's also good for fertility. So this is not something we can just say, oh, this is hopeless. You can't change what people want to do. This is something where we can totally do it and we should. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both for that spirited uh, discussion. We're now going to go to Q&A. Please submit questions via our event webpage through Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Again, please use our event hashtag Cato events so that we can see your questions. Uh, I'd actually like to start us off by asking the first question directed at Larry. Uh, Larry, you wrote this book before the current pandemic. And in a recent interview, you said, we're still in a very good period overall. We're just suffering from a sudden disruption that's very traumatic. My question is, could you elaborate on that and on how, if at all, has the pandemic affected your thinking about the book's message or your own perspective on progress? Uh, just briefly. Uh, sure. It, first of all, in the short run, we've got a serious problem to overcome and no, anybody who denies that isn't thinking very well. In the long run, nothing has changed. We've always had the risk of a pandemic. The risk happened. It happened in 1918. By the 1920s, we were in one of the biggest booms in history. It happened in 1957. By the early 1960s, we were in one of the biggest booms in history. And now it's happening again. And, and people don't know enough history to realize how much pandemics have interrupted economic progress in the past and how we've recovered and moved on to new heights fairly quickly. But that's exactly what has happened. And it, it, it will become a low level endemic disease unless we find a really effective vaccine. And I, I hate to say this, but no coronavirus vaccine has ever been developed. So it could be a while before that we're completely back to normal, but the economy will grow because people reinvest part of what they currently have in the future, which is something that they've always done as long as they had the institutions around them and the support systems uh, to, to make that trade of present for future benefits possible. Thank you. All right, so we're going to go to our first question from the audience. Um, Ed asks uh, to Larry, Steven Pinker's book, from a few years ago argued that the world has become and is becoming more peaceful and less contentious than ever. He's referring to Steven Pinker's book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature. How does Professor Pinker's thesis fit with your, uh, your book's ideas, Mr. Siegel, he asks. Well, I rely on his work for one chapter, which is about violence. Uh, He's right, but it's one of the actually one of the weaker arguments in the book, because you have to divide by the population to get his result. The, the amount of, of violence per human being on Earth has declined precipitously. There are some primitive societies, a third of the men die through murder, which is what some anthropologists found, I believe, in New Guinea. And in the Middle Ages, societies were 10 or more times as violent as, as they are on, on the earth now. But in terms of absolute mortality from violence, uh, the 20th century was the all-time winner with the two catastrophic world wars. But I, I basically think that Pinker is right, that we're finding behavioral and institutional ways to reduce the impact of both state-sponsored violence, which is war, and interpersonal violence, uh, it, it, the trend is downward, but it's not persistently and always and everywhere downward. It, it bumps up every once in a while. Okay, we have another question. Uh, this one is from Phoebe, who asks, once a family has a child, their experience may likely affect them more than the offer of a tax credit. Is there some place to read how Mr. Kaplan has learned that tax credits encourage people to have more children? That question is for Brian. 
Uh, sure. So if you go to the piece that I wrote for Cato Unbound on population, you can just Google Cato Unbound and my and my name and population. Uh, so I in that piece, I put a lot of emphasis on this one study of the effect of baby bonuses in Quebec. So basically, this was a case where they not only had baby bonuses for some people, not others, but so, you know, it, it, the baby bonus turned on in some areas at different times than others. So basically, it was about the gold standard of social science in terms of really measuring uh, whether it was the effect, because you know some people are randomly affected, some are not, different times. So you can do multiple different comparisons and see how much the effect is. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that social scientists do. There was a similar study that was done in Austria. Um, so that's basically the, the approach that I would take. Um, so, you know, obviously you could do something even better. So you really could do this as an experimental program in some areas. But the thing I would just say is that the estimates that we have that are already around are so favorable that the truth could be much less favorable than it appears. And it's still a fantastic bargain. So this is the kind of thing I think we should just go, go start doing full speed ahead and then measure things a little more precisely later, because however it is, it's a good deal. Thank you. Um, Melvin on YouTube asks, is it true that China and India and some of Africa uh, have improved lives, but relative to aspiration, too many will never get out of poverty and realize their human flourishing? Do we triage them? And he's asking that to Larry, I believe. I don't think we do anything. <laughs> We allow them to do what they want in their own interests. If you asked a, an American in 1820, and when a substantial population was in extreme poverty in this country, uh, whether the possibility that their great-grandchildren would be relatively affluent was enough to get them to keep doing what they were doing, they would probably have said yes. In fact, they were probably relying on it. <laughs> we try to think beyond ourselves and that every generation tries to raise its successor uh, to a higher plane of life, to, to cite an old preacher <laughs> who I uh, used to remember his name. I, I don't think that many people in India and Africa are going to live to see themselves be middle class, but at the current rate of growth, they know it's going to happen to their children or grandchildren. And so, no, we don't triage them. We allow them to do what they want to do within the limits of the possible. Thank you. We have another question. I believe this one is for Brian. Uh, from Michael McCracken, he asks, with more and more people, there is less and less biodiversity, a feature that we depend on and learn from. So what is the balance between allowing space for biodiversity and population? So again, this is, of course, a problem that human beings have always had when the population was 8,000 or 8 million or 80 million. You still have to say, well, if we have more humans, there's going to be less biodiversity. Uh, of course, it's only in recent decades that anyone has even worried about it. Uh, I guess the main thing I would say about it is that there have been a few economists that tried to actually measure what is the value to mankind of allowing additional biodiversity. And the usual answer is barely any, right? You would have to leave such a vast area unused by human beings in order to get a very small gain. So in particular, I think there's a piece in journal political economy that's trying to measure the medicinal value of rainforest in Africa, or not, excuse me, rainforest in the Amazon. And again, they found very little, even though I think they wanted to find a lot. So I think my honest answer is that the animals that are useful to human beings are going to be fine. And uh, the other ones, uh, of course, more people, there's going to be bad for them. But um, I mean, I, philosophically, I don't think that's a, a problem. Again, of course, if it started to wind up hurting humans, this would be a different story, but I don't see much sign of that. Um, if I could also just weigh in on the previous question on the triage, you know, I would say that you know, actually what rich countries currently do for poor countries is a lot worse than triage, because the idea of triage is that you split people up into three groups 
and one third you help a lot and the other third you help if you got spare resources and the rest of the other last third you don't worry about i mean the reality is that first world countries basically do next to nothing for poor countries and i actually have a book saying there's something really great and easy that rich countries could do for poor countries to greatly help them and i happen to have the book right here yes so it's my book open borders uh, the science and ethics of immigration so if rich countries were just to allow much more immigration for poor countries, uh, I argue in this book that this would be great for not only the people in poor countries, it would be great for the people that stay behind because they were, their families would be able to help them out. And furthermore, it would be great for us because when people migrate from places where their productivity is low to places where it's high, they enrich mankind and they sell the extra stuff to us. So there is actually plenty that could be done and really would require less than zero sacrifice on our part. So hopefully more of that will happen. Thank you. Um, we have an anonymous question that I believe is probably for Larry. Uh, someone asks, I'd like to hear some discussion of climate change, the consequences of which humanity is only now beginning to experience. Well, there's a saying that it, when you open a can of worms, you can only close it back again using a much larger can. I, the climate is certainly changing. I don't know what the consequences are going to be. The error bars are so wide that they range from on one end being possibly somewhat beneficial or, you, or neutral, you don't care if it happens or not, to on the other end, something resembling the end of the world. So when the forecast is uh, has that much uncertainty to it, it's hard to know what to do. I believe that the main concern is that some people will have to migrate from areas that are either too hot or are going to be underwater if the sea level continues to rise at a faster rate than it has before, which is about a foot every century and a half that that's really slow enough to adapt to fairly easily but if it accelerates substantially because of melting of parts of the ice caps then it, they'll have to migrate a little faster we have always migrated in response to climate change i'm here in the united states because europe became less agriculturally productive to the point of famine in the late middle ages and that spurred the age of discovery and and subsequent settle, settlement of, of the United States by Europeans and of other countries by Europeans. It, it, the next time we'll have weather satellites and airplanes and instant communication and it will be a lot less costly, but it's still a cost. Okay, uh, we have a question that I think both of you might want to answer, but let's start with Larry again. Another anonymous questioner asks, how do we get the mainstream media to stop scaring people with scenarios that are not likely, i.e., why would anyone listen to the Ehrlichs of the world? Of course, that is a reference to Paul Ehrlich, the Stanford University biologist who is always going on about uh, overpopulation and disaster. Uh, Larry, do you have anything to say? We have to present our own evidence and viewpoints in a persuasive manner to as many people as we can possibly reach. You can't stop someone, nor do you want to, from expressing a different point of view. Um, I'm That's wondering if Brian, you may I also to want say. to speak to that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic question. I think about this a lot. So how can you get mainstream media to stop terrifying people? And my first reaction is that would be like trying to get McDonald's to stop selling hamburgers. You know, the, their whole industry is producing an endless stream of negativity for people to watch and sit there staring slack jawed in horror uh, as to what it would take to get the media to be very different. You would actually have to change what people want to watch. As long as people want to watch scary stories based upon very thin quantitative work, that's what's going to be there. I mean, 
So, I mean, a few times I've actually take, you know, taken my kids and just said, all right, let's go and look at this news here and just, you know, don't pay attention to really what they're saying. Just think about it at a meta level. Like, why are they showing this stuff? Why are these the stories? Why aren't there other stories they're showing? And it doesn't take even a child very long to realize, well, this is what people want to watch. It doesn't really properly describe the world. It's that they're actually just finding the worst things on earth and trying to make everyone think that this is representative of the human experience. In terms of what else you can do, and there, there is a, a substantial literature on just trying to be more persuasive. So I agree with Larry there. I'm a big fan of Dale Carnegie's classic, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Just things like smile at people, treat everyone like your friend, right? So the mentality of people are your enemy and you've got to crush them. That may be the way you're feeling, but you'll never get anywhere if you act on that. You've got to go and talk to people like they're your friends, right? And win them over. And then maybe they'll listen to you. And you know, say, yeah, well, that doesn't work either. And, yeah, well, it's just a matter of things that fail less spectacularly than others. Uh, so, and of course, just sheer persistence is a big help. So I would recommend that as well. Okay, another question uh, directed at, I believe, Brian. Uh, Dwayne Horton asks, should we be content that there are only 880 mountain gorillas remaining in the world? Are humans so much more worthwhile than the other great apes? I think this is in reference to the earlier biodiversity question. Hmm. Honestly, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, I can see there being a greater need for them so that there can be nature reserves and zoos that will, that will have more of these animals. Yeah, but like, you know, if you could save one of these apes or a human baby, I think it would be crazy to go and say, I'm going to save the ape instead of the baby. So um, it's the kind of thing where when people say it, I just think, well, really? Like, so if you could either save a, an ape or a person, you'd save the ape? Uh, so not me. Um, Right. And this is a case, I mean, I have a lot of unconventional views. I don't think this view is even so weird. Okay. We have a question from Richard for Larry. Uh, Richard writes, there is no indication people are more inclined to cooperate uh, now than in the past, which surely they must to participate in the potential abundance. So the potential is probably illusory. I'm not quite prepared to answer that because I and haven't. I think he's seen asking about. Yet. He's asking if human nature has not changed, how can we really make progress? I think. Well, human nature hasn't changed because it's not going to, except through the very slow process of evolution. But part of human nature is a desire to cooperate in order to compete, and, and people. You know, even the, the caveman who invented the wheel had to get somebody to lift up the cart so he could put the wheels on the axle and make the thing go, because without an axle, a wheel isn't usable. So I, I don't know that there's evidence that people aren't cooperating or are cooperating less than they have in the past, so I haven't evaluated the evidence, and without having done so, it doesn't make sense for me to, re to re really address that question. But if you look at the data, the economy has grown by 1.8% a year for 200 years, which suggests a lot of cooperation in the past. And that is the part of human nature that I don't expect to change in it also. Thank you. And uh, did you say you wanted to respond to the, um, the biodiversity question as well, Larry? Yeah, I think I can do it in 10 seconds. If the baby has been born, I'm going to save the baby, not the ape. If the baby is a thought in someone's head, whether or not to have the baby, then it becomes a, a, a reasonable question subject to the, the, uh, the decision processes all of us make every day. And I don't, I don't have a clear-cut answer to that you should have the baby. Okay, uh, we have an anonymous question for Brian. Uh, anonymous asks, Brian, you say that having more kids is a positive benefit to the economy. On the other hand, you say it is not a good advantage to a family's finances with your farmer example. 
so if uh, $10,000 a child can't begin to make it economically wiser for a family to grow and grow, where is the flaw in this observation? Uh, yes. Well, the resolution, if kids are not good for business, what are they good for? Why do families have them? And I think the answer is one that almost any parent would have told you their history. We're not having them to make money. We're having them because we love them, because we want to have kids. They're a consumer good, not an investment good. So once you think of it that way, then you realize, yeah, well, in the same way that when ice cream is 30% off, I might get an extra ice cream cone. When the price of kids is lower, I'll wind up having extra kids. So, and again, you know, like you can, let's see, to quote Barbara Streisand, people, people who need people. Right? So this is the real reason why people have kids. I mean, the idea that, that people in other, some other societies are doing it to get cheap farm labor. So I think it's basically something you can only say if you've never actually read about a farm. Once you've read about the farm, you realize, well, like, that's a terrible way to get farm labor. Like, first make a baby and then have him raise him for 15 years and pour tons of resources in him and train him how to do the job, and then he'll help if he doesn't wander off and go and go to the city or try to start his own farm. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, kids are consumption good. And, Ian, when I say that kids are benefits, I mean an emotional benefit, not one that is a good way to make money. Yeah, I mean, definitely, if all that you ever want to do is to maximize your net worth, don't have any kids. You know, don't have any friends that you ever buy lunch for to sit there hoarding your money like Ebenezer Scrooge or uh, Scrooge McDuck. But I wouldn't recommend this as a way to live your life. Okay, we're going to go slightly over since we started a little bit late um, in answering uh, one last question. This is from David Simon. Thank you for this question, David. Uh, David says, Julian Simon's position in the ultimate resource to uh, Julian Simon being the famous uh, economist who is against overpopulation uh, hysteria. Uh, Julian Simon's position in The Ultimate Resource 2 was that we don't know whether population will continue to grow forever, but that regardless of whether population continues to grow or eventually peaks, we can expect that people's incomes will rise indefinitely. Isn't that the bottom line? Uh, Larry, would you like to take that first? It's the bottom line is over the overall utility or satisfaction of all the people that exist combined, which includes some adjustment for the people who have not yet been born and their satisfaction and utility, because presumably you care about about them somewhat. The incomes can rise to forever, but what does it mean to say, let's say that you make a Bayesian adjustment to the 1.8 and let's call it 1% growth because it's harder to grow a number that's very large than one that's very small. What does it mean to have 1% growth for a thousand years? Well, we, our incomes would be 30 times what they are now. For somebody on the verge of starvation, that's wonderful. If my income were 30 times what it were now, I couldn't consume 30 times what I consume. So we'd have to consume it in quality and experiences. And it's just there isn't time to consume 30 times what I'm consuming now. If it happens for 100,000 years, well, then it, it becomes a number so high that that it doesn't make sense to even discuss. It, it doesn't have much meaning. Yeah, the bottom line is that everyone gets an opportunity to realize their potential as a human being, whatever that means, and it means something different for everyone, but there are a lot of people who do not have that opportunity yet, and they will, and that's a good thing. And what happens after that, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, Brian, do you have any thoughts on that quote from Julian Simon? Yeah. So as I said before, I think that Larry is right. That Larry is right. That Simon is wrong. That population growth can continue forever. Right. So it's just physically impossible. Uh, however, uh, the, the, you know, the, the point of we don't know whether we've reached the point where population has gotten bad. You know, there's that. And then there's, well, actually, we have every reason to think we're still in the zone where more population is good. 
And as to how far we can go is a really good question. But there's, I just say there's no sign that things are actually, any, that, that population is anything other than a net positive overall uh, for now. So we can go a lot further. And then, yes, uh, also, of course, uh, I, think, yeah, I agree with Larry that in terms of, you know, can income keep going on forever? If, again, income is for physical goods, then that's limited to. If it's for the quality of life, then that is not a physical thing. And so, in principle, that could really go on indefinitely. So, you know, for example, just imagine that we plug into virtual reality. And in virtual reality, the resources really could be infinite. Right? So, just imagine being in a fantasy world where you can have any number of castles you want, right? That's doable actually, right? There's no physical constraint to that. So, you know, I just, you know, say the spirit of what Simon said is right, even though the actual specific claim was not quite right. Okay, thank you to uh, both of you, Larry and Brian, and to everyone who participated. Uh, this was uh, very spirited. We had a lot of great questions come in and I apologize that we could not get to all of them. The video recording of the event will be available on Cato's webpage tomorrow, and Larry's slides that we couldn't show due to the technical difficulties will be available on the webpage as well. Please be sure to check out the book, Viewer Richard Greener by Lawrence B. Siegel. Check out Brian's work on population and consider visiting humanprogress.org to learn more about the progress that humanity is making. Thank you. <laughs>